Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, congrats, we made it to the last session of uh, Nariscope. Uh, <laughs> So if everyone can just stay alert and awake for just a little <laughs> bit more, uh, let's dive in. Um, my name is Jess Haskins, and this is my talk, World Building Out of Bounds. Um, so first, I'll just give you a little bit about who I actually am and where I'm coming at all of this from. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm a game designer, writer, and editor in Brooklyn. I've worked at a few different studios at New York, um, some that you can see there, mostly small indie outfits. Uh, which is sort of where I like to spend my time. Uh, and you can see some of the games that I've worked on there, some of the ones that made it out into the world. And in 2016, I started my own design consultancy, Paperback Studio. And a lot of my clients are still indie developers and startups. And I help them with things like story development and narrative mechanics and dialogue writing and script editing. Uh, it's a pretty wide range of things and a pretty um, wide variety of projects. Um, I really love adventure games, and I've worked on a few of those, um, currently including Grundislav Games' forthcoming Western title, Rosewater. Um, and I've recently gotten more involved with IF and interactive TV and choice-based games as well. Um, I also teach about world building and game design. Um, and I do a fair bit of community organizing and advocacy through the local IGDA NYC chapter and a group called NYC Indie Games. Um, so both with this kind of work and my game development work, a lot of it deals with um, interactive storytelling and narrative design, world building, and community and inclusion and representation. Um, so not coincidentally, those are the types of themes that I'm going to be talking about uh, today. So why am I here today, and what are we actually talking about? Um, my talks usually start out as a rebuttal to some kind of common idea that I've heard floating around out there that I think deserves an answer, kind of needs to be debunked somehow. Um, this talk is a sort of sequel to one that I gave a couple years ago at AdventureX in London uh, called The Politics of World Building. And that one was written in response to something that you may have heard certain game developers say. We weren't making a political statement. Uh, I'm sure you have heard that sentiment out there too. And this is a deflection. It's kind of an internalized acceptance uh, to stave off this uh, unfortunately common complaint that uh, game developers sometimes face. Games should be fun, not political. Um, so without going too deep into it, because that was that talk, not this one, but my answer to that is roughly something like, <laughs> yes, you made a political statement. Art is political, therefore games are political. You're making a political statement every time you tell a story or create a fictional world with implicit rules about how you think things actually work in the world. And if you don't know what that statement is that you're making, uh, then you haven't given enough thought to what kind of conscious and unconscious messages you're sending with your work. And the corollary to this idea is that you should think about the messages that you're sending with your work. You should approach your world building with intention and care and try to create novel, cohesive worlds with rip rich representation without resorting to genre tropes and cultural stereotypes. So I'm not going to rehash the rest of it here. Slides and video are up on my medium if you'd like to see it for yourself. Um, but. With that talk and that previously, I've spent time discussing this sort of theory of world building and representation about the need for us to get outside of our bubbles and construct these thoughtful worlds from the foundation up, um, how we need to expand the palette of representation in our media and expand the types of stories that we tell so we don't, as a culture, just keep churning out more and more of the same. But I haven't too, talked too much about the craft about the decision-making process or the concrete strategies that go into doing this. Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today, some of the tools and guidelines that I've found to be useful uh, in my own work. And I'll also share some of the ways that I've approached these problems in case studies um, drawn from my own writing and editing work. And mainly this talk is also a rebuttal to another statement that I've heard expressed a couple of times. And I think it might be holding a lot of us back. 
That's not my story to tell. This comes up sometimes when there's a question of representation and we're not quite sure how to approach or handle it. Maybe we're considering incorporating a character who has a particular marginalized background that's not our own, or we want to depict a particular historical period or struggle, or we want to address some other sensitive topic that we can't really draw on our own personal experience, whether you know direct experience or cultural background to talk about those things. So that's not my story to tell is again, kind of the internalized defensive response uh, to sort of ward off another criticism that you sometimes hear thrown at creators. Stay in your lane. Um, there's often a lot of anxiety and fear surrounding these conversations about representation and diversity. There's a fear of saying the wrong thing, of not being woke enough, uh, putting your foot in it and getting piled on. Why risk including a queer character or making your protagonist a person of color or basing your setting on a foreign culture if it's just going to invite criticism and remarks like this if you get something wrong? So a common reaction is to just disengage, decide that it's not worth the risk to wade into these waters, that maybe the safer option is just to keep telling the kinds of stories that you're comfortable telling with settings and characters that you're already familiar with, just more of the same. And I think it's really sad when that happens. So before I go any further, I should probably clarify who I'm actually addressing here. Um, it's probably best to start with who I'm not talking to. <laughs> One, I'm not really talking to companies and large teams um, because for them, my advice is really simple. I don't need a whole hour talk or maybe a completely different whole hour talk. Um, it's just staff your project with people who identify with the group or experience that you want to represent. If you're making Black Panther the video game, hire black folks in positions of creative control and step back, done. Um, if you're looking around <laughs> at your team and there's a notable lack of diversity of any kind, then just fix that with more inclusive hiring practices and go listen to the people who can tell you how to do that. I'm also not really talking to people who are chiefly interested in exploring their own personal identities or cultural background through their work. Um, I think that's a powerful and wonderful thing. And if that's you, then just go forth and make great art and or lots of money. I wish you much success. So who I am talking to is primarily indies, to solo creators or small already existing teams um, that is, the band's already together and you're not hiring or seeking new collaborators. You just want to make something. Maybe you individually or collectively belong to one or more marginalized groups, or maybe not. Um, maybe you're not sure how to include representation of other groups in your work or whether you even should. So if this is you, and if you've ever had some version of that thought, not my story to tell, then I'm talking to you. I think when we shy away from telling stories about certain kinds of people for fear of giving offense, then those identities remain invisible in our own work, at the very least, if not in the culture at large. And maybe even worse, we leave the burden of representation entirely to the people whose story we've decided that it is. Now they have a duty to tell it or no one else will touch it. Uh, no one else will do that. But I want to hear more of those stories, speaking as just a player and a consumer. Um, and as creators, we should accept the challenge of telling them so that they're available for everyone. And that means accepting the responsibility of doing those stories justice, which takes just a little bit of extra work. If you're not willing to put in that small effort, then sure, it's probably better not to try. If you're not going to put forward that effort, then probably you will bungle things and offend people if you don't think there's anything that you, know, you don't already know that you, know, you need to find out about. Um, so in that case, please do just stick with what you know and sit out the rest of this talk, I guess. I'll see you at the after party. <laughs> but if you think there are certain kinds of stories that you're simply not allowed to tell or wonder if you can tell, then I'd like to challenge that idea. 
And through the lens of my own personal experience and practice, I'll talk about how you can leave your lane and take your world building out of bounds without running into trouble and why you should, um, but not necessarily in that order. So first, I want to share just a few words about how I approach ideas about diversity and representation, how I think about these questions when I'm going about my work and some of the things that I've, I've seen out there in the world. Um, there's this hashtag that's gaining currency in the publishing world. Um, hasn't quite filtered out that much into games yet, but especially in the young adult fiction world, own voices, hashtag own voices. Um, it's about supporting and amplifying creators who wor whose work reflects their own experience as people with marginalized identities. And that's certainly something that should be celebrated and supported. Um, unfortunately, in the darker corners of this is that this idea is sometimes used as a cudgel to punish writers, and it asserts that only certain people have the right to represent certain marginalized identities in their work. It's a little bit of a, of a low-key culture war going on. Um, it can also sort of unintentionally become a straitjacket to the very people that it's supposed to be uplifting. Uh, taken to extremes, this idea suggests that the work of a marginalized creator is most valuable when it's turned inward, centered on the personal, rooted in some lived experience, and surfacing this deep truths about their identity for public consum consumption and enlightenment. Um, but what if you just want to forget about your labels for a little while and write flights of fancy about airships or robots or dragons? Um, maybe people don't want to look at your work because they expect a certain type of output from you. So hashtag own voices and write what you know, I think they do have a place and they can be very valuable, but they should be used to remove limits, not enforce them. So rather than worry about what we can and can't write, I'd rather we all be empowered to just strike off for new territories. In the world of game development, there's this other hashtag, hashtag I need diverse games. Uh, it's also now a nonprofit organization. It's dedicated to supporting a greater, a greater diversity of experience and representation in the games that we consume. And I love this. I need diverse games. We all do. On the one hand, it's a call for a more diverse pool of creators, some more inclusive teams, lowered barriers letting more people from the margins have a crack at telling their stories. While increasing the diversity of people making games is one surefire way to get more diverse games, there's another way that we can pursue in parallel, and that's just make the games themselves more diverse, individually, by depicting a broader range of representation in the game worlds, and collectively, by making new games that are different from all the old ones. Diversity is a property of groups, not people. And if you're a solo creator, you are what you are. You don't get to make yourself more or less diverse, but you can make your own corpus of work more diverse or increase the diversity of work that's out there in the universe by what you contribute. So to briefly illustrate the importance of representation as a final goal, it's reflected in the end product itself, I'd like to point to Star Trek. I like to point to Star Trek to illustrate a lot of things because I'm a nerd. Um, so Gene Roddenberry was going to make a TV series no matter what. He actually made a few of them and mostly they were kind of terrible. Um, but one of them was Star Trek. And he decided that a diverse cast and progressive politics were important to the vision of the future that he wanted to portray. So he put a black woman, a Japanese man, and amid Cold War anxieties, a Russian kid on the bridge of his ship despite him personally having none of those identities, and despite the cultural backlash and executive interference that he knew he would face. And those choices proved to have massive cultural impact, uh, to the point where uh, Martin Luther King Jr. famously implored Nichelle Nichols not to leave the show because of her visibility as an empowered, resp respected black woman character uh, on TV when such depictions were pretty much unheard of. And also famously, um, there's a story that seeing someone who looked like her on screen was a formative experience for Whoopi Goldberg. 
Um, and she, of course, went on to go and create many more powerful you know, representations of her own. Um, but the story always makes me think that, gosh, if Gene Roddenberry had decided that the story of Uhura wasn't his to tell, or if he just you know, peopled his enterprise with a bunch of white American men, that we, the culture, would have been a lot poorer for that. Um, to take another example a little closer to home, um, Technocrat Games point-and-click adventure, uh, Techno Babylon, uh, published by Wajidai Games, is a really great instance, I think, of a solo developer who committed to building this original multicultural setting, uh, a cosmopolitan African cyberpunk city with a really diverse cast of characters. And the game was well received and praised for its representation, um, notably the inclusion of this character, Dr. Max Lau, whose identity as a trans woman is certainly surfaced and made visible in the game, but also ref refreshingly incidental to the plot. Um, so this game was written by one person, uh, James Dearden, who is neither a woman nor trans, um, but he consulted with trans act activists in the course of writing the story and ended up rewriting certain scenes in response to the input that he got. And again, if he decided that it wasn't his place to put words in the mouth of a trans woman, uh, to tell this like coming out story in the course of his game and left that character out or omitted this part of her identity, then we never would have gotten this depiction and the world of Techno Babylon would have been a little less cosmopolitan. So I mentioned those two examples to make the case that valuable depictions of diversity don't exclusively come from creators who themselves identify with underrepresented groups. And unless you are committed exclusively to acts of self-representation, if you want to reflect just the varieties of being that actually exist out there in the world, eventually you will have to reach outside of your own experience. So finally, how do you actually go about doing that? For this next section, I'm going to reference a framework uh, that was put out by the Australian nonprofit organization Queerly Represent Me. Um, I think they do a really nice job of setting it out, and I've found it incredibly useful. Um, they basically organize their advice for writing diverse games into the form of a decision tree, um, which I've reproduced here so that we can walk through it step by step together. So, step one, you've decided to make a game. Yay! <laughs> so, you either do or do not care about diversity. And if we've lost you already on this step, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> um, there is a dead end path there. Um, the rest of us, let's all proceed along the path of caring. <laughs> Next, you either are or are not a member of the marginalized groups that you want to depict. Um, if you are writing about your own identities, then as I've mentioned before, that's great. Um, that's not what, really what we're talking about today. Um, but before we move on, let's just follow that path and take a look at where it leads. So, you write using your own experiences and do additional research. That's really solid advice. When in doubt, always research. Um, this is actually a good place to pause and uh, talk a little bit about research in general. Because no matter what you're writing, whether it's based in your own experience or not, you're going to need to do some. There's this kind of logical fallacy that I think about a lot that's been called generalizing from fictional evidence. Um, and it's something we're all guilty of from time to time. It's one reason why storytelling is so powerful. When you're reasoning and trying to make decisions, you weight evidence from something that you've seen or heard in a work of fiction just as strongly as if it were something that actually happened to you firsthand. It seems like it really happened, and it seems like it should be a reliable guide to the future. In the ancestral environment, of course, this made good sense. If the tribal elder was telling you a story about the foolish hunter who went out and got eaten by a lion, then you might want to treat that as fact and be just as wary around lions as if you yourself witnessed that hunter getting eaten. But nowadays, our voracious consumption of ever more fanciful fiction has given us the illusion of having had reliable first-hand experience of all sorts of outlandish things. We feel like we would know just what to do in case of a plague of zombies, 
a, a robot uprising, or a dalliance with a sexy vampire, <laughs> or... <laughs> just, so we have expectations about how these sorts of things go, despite none of them ever actually having happened. Our reliance on fictional evidence also gives us a sense of familiarity with places we've never been, and people we've never met, and cultures that we've never actually experienced. So we might feel prepared to, say, write a story about someone with a marginalized identity, even if we've never met anyone like that in our life. But chances are we've been hearing stories based on stories based on stories far removed from the original source material and bearing little relation to reality. So when you're imagining new worlds and stories um, that you want to create based on real places or cultures that you've either seen in the movies or read about in books, just sort of absorbed from culture, take a moment to consider whether you're relying too much on fictional evidence. And then you'll probably want to do some more research to get your facts straight. So back to the decision tree and moving on. Um, for those of us in the other group who do want to write about other marginalized identities. So you either do or do not have the funds to hire paid collaborators or consultants. Um, if you do, then hire them. That's another place where our journey ends. Um, but if you don't, uh, let's, let's investigate what this entails. So first, before you trip merrily along the can't afford it path, um, really take a moment to consider that. Um, maybe you're bootstrapping a project largely on your own, but have you set aside some budget for external services like a composer or a PR consultant, cover illustration, marketing, fees for exhibiting or submitting to awards? Um, how about just the hardware and software? Uh, you're probably not making and releasing something for literally zero dollars. And I know that you know, budgets are tight and the struggle is real, but if you are making depictions of a marginalized group key in your work, then consider allocating even just a few hundred dollars for a diversity consultant. Um, that you know, it's better than nothing and uh, they're, they're easier to find and work with now than ever before. And it could make the difference between a sterling example of positive representation or an embarrassingly inaccurate and even offensive portrayal. So in the fiction publishing world, again, uh, the practice of paid consultants reviewing a work to assess how it presents marginalized identities and experiences is known as sensitivity reading, or sometimes diversity reading or diversity editing. Uh, Writer's Digest, in particular, has sort of argued that we should adopt the term diversity editing, um, which kind of emphasizes the active role that these editorial professionals play in improving your work. Um, so if that term floats your boat, by all means, go for it. Sensitivity reading is a little more widespread. Um, but whatever you call it, it's gotten more common in recent years, and I'd really like to see it become standard practice for all kinds of games. You can find sensitivity readers specializing in particular categories of sexual or gender identity, race, national, ethnic, cultural background, lifestyle, family situation, as well as topics like disability, mental illness, addiction, sexual abuse, domestic violence. Um, multiple readers might cover a single project, each viewing the work through a different lens. Now, it's important to keep in mind that sensitivity reading is not a global stamp of approval from a marginalized group or a shield against criticism. Um, it's also not a form of censorship like some hand-wringing critics might hyperbolically claim. Um, as with any editorial relationship, your readers' personal tastes and opinions will inform their feedback, and they might flag something that another reader would have approved or just let pass without comment. Um, so remember that your consultant is an individual professional that you're working with and not a spokesperson with their for their identity who's going to rubber stamp your work. So how do you go about finding your sensitivity reader or diversity editor? Um, queerly, re queerly Represent Me is another, um, it's an excellent place to start. 
um, and it's actually focused on the medium of video games. Um, so in addition to a library of resources and a database of representation in games, they also do offer customized consulting services addressing uh, diversity topics. Um, Fail Better Games is uh, one example of a company that's used them and has glowing testimonials. Um, so as I said, I'd like us all to adopt these practices. Um, you can also go poking around some of the same places that you would to find a reader for a traditional book. Um, one great resource is the Editors of Color database. Um, and you can browse for editors by um, a variety of terms. Um, you can even look for editors who explicitly include video games in the type of media that they work with. So this is another, I suspect, highly underutilized resource that game developers could start taking advantage of. OK, back to the flowchart. If you do have the money or have properly saved or allocated it, you've hired some help. Um, but if not, uh, then we move on to the next step. If you can't pay someone, do you have any friends with the relevant background who would give you some feedback? Um, in practice, this might not look too different from the paid consultant, except maybe with meals, favors, or warm, friendly fuzzies exchanged instead <laughs> of money. Um, and the usual rules about asking friends for favors, and especially for feedback, apply. Um, they might flake. The level of sustained effort and depth is likely to be less than you could get from paying someone. Um, they're likely to have less experienced, uh, be less you know, less skilled, nuanced, tactful, et cetera, in providing critical feedback of the kind that you need. Um, and they might also pull their punches or give you a little less honest or less full evaluation for fear of hurting your feelings. Um, and these are all the same risks that uh, you get and you might be familiar with if you use friends and family in lieu of paid play testers or QA testers, by the way. Um, so if you've ever gone that route, you're probably familiar with its drawbacks. Um, still, this can be immensely helpful and you can get wonderful feedback and if you're not in a position where you can pay people, like do try and find someone to show it to. And now we come to the part of the flow chart that's unexpected ter or unexplored territory. Um, you're writing about a marginalized group that you don't belong to, you can't pay anyone to give you feedback and you don't know anyone from this group personally that you can turn to for a favor. So you're on your own. What do you do? What do you do? Um, so this is going to be my best synthesis of all the good advice that I've heard so far and tips that I try to use um, when I'm working. Um, one, do research. Um, that, that, there it is again, like just do it anyway, whether or not you're using any of these other resources or not. Beware the trap of fictional evidence. Uh, treat the Roman Empire or the Viking longship or the Wild West as a place as mysterious and unexplored as any other place or period uh, in history that you could possibly name and research it from ground zero as if you literally did not know the first thing about it. Um, because if you're being honest, you probably actually don't. If you're about to construct a setting that's based in whole or in part on some foreign culture that you only know through your fictional sources, medieval-inspired high fantasy, say, or an orientalist Arabian Nights setting, or piracy on the high seas via a Disney theme park, via Robert Louis Stevenson, um, then just stop right there and hit the books. Um, the history books, that is, not the story books. Uh, although, actually, remember that the act of writing history is not that different from writing stories. It's always an interpretive narrative act um, and it has its own particular lens and biases. So instead, when you can, actually skip those and go straight for the primary sources. And as a bonus, the work that you produce based on those primary source details that you learned in the course of your fascinating research will likely be so far removed from the familiar genre trappings that your work will be hailed as a truly refreshing new twist on the genre, a real breath of fresh air. <laughs> so there's something to strive for. You sort of get that built in. Two, 
consume works that are created by the people that you're writing about. Um, read some of that hashtag own voices fiction. Read nonfiction. Listen to them telling their own stories and immerse yourself in those rhythms. Um, there's not too much else to say about this one, so we'll just move on. Three, read criticism about how the group you're writing about has been re represented in other media and read thoughtful critiques of representation generally. Um, there's, here's one great book, um, Gaming Representation, Race, Gender, and Sexuality in Video Games, um, edited, edited by Jennifer Malkowski and Treandria M. Russworm. <laughs> Um, by reading essays like the ones in this book, you can see like, who got it right and what have people gotten wrong. Um, what are critics saying about how they see themselves depicted and what frustrations and pitfalls can you be aware of and avoid altogether? Four, if you are going it alone with, without consultation, um, I strongly recommend avoid centering narratives of trauma and struggle for characters with marginalized identities that you don't share. Um, even with all the research in the world and the best of intentions, without a deeper understanding of those issues or someone to help you avoid missteps, um, you do run the risk of creating something that's inappropriate, offensive, or hurtful inadvertently to the people who are uh, reading or playing your game. Instead, focus on creating positive, empowering depictions of characters who have purpose and narrative agency. Um, giving underrepresented fig under figures a visible place in your story can be powerful and inspiring all in itself. You're not obliged to also bring in all of the historical systems of oppression and erasure attached to that identity if you're not personally equipped to make sense of them. Just show some folks being awesome and you'll do some good. Relatedly, your fantastic settings and invented worlds do not need to recapitulate real world historical patterns of sexism, racism, other forms of oppression, just to make them gritty or realistic. Also, your impressions of how historical racism, sexism, oppression, et cetera, function for whatever time and place you're taking as your model are probably inaccurate. <laughs> um, you know, see that earlier point about fictional evidence and checking the primary sources. Um, also, just a shout out to uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Slit's talk yesterday, which did a great job of discussing this idea specifically for gender in the Middle Ages in uh, really excellent detail. Um, because a very common offender is this popular image of this strictly white European Middle Ages, which is pretty much pure fantasy drawn from a sort of history of popular and historical depictions. Um, and this trope uh, that we all kind of carry around in our heads really uh, overlooks the reality of the medieval period that was marked by this high degree of international trade and travel, um, where the modern concept of race had not been constructed yet and therefore didn't exist. Um, and it was, say, religion more than skin color or natural origin that was a really salient marker of identity. And for more on this idea, I highly recommend um, the excellent series of blog posts that you can find at The Public Medievalist. Um, their first one is on race, racism in the Middle Ages. They have gender sexism in the Middle Ages, and I'm really looking forward to their forthcoming series all about games and medieval depictions. The medieval POC Tumblr blog is another great source for visual inspiration and uh, argues using original uh, historical artworks against this popular misconception of the all-white European Middle Ages. And one more shout out to just one of the best books I was ever assigned as an undergrad studying medieval literature. Um, this is a really uh, illuminating compilation of primary sources. Um, this is the kind of thing to look for when you're looking for that primary source research. Um, it collects personal accounts by members of religious minorities, gender and sexual nonconformists, disease sufferers, and other disenfranchised and marginalized people, so in their own words. So next tip, 
Uh, number five, metaphors won't save you. <laughs> Substituting fantasy races for real world groups so that you can depict the disenfranchisement of forest elves or sentient androids as a thinly veiled stand in for the civil rights struggle can really backfire and wind up trivializing real histories of oppression. If you're working with this kind of narrative material, you should still seek feedback from people who can advise on how to sensitively handle themes of real world oppression. Even if you are only talking about the subjugation of the hobgoblins or the closeted lifestyle of vampires. Six, work to increase the diversity of your incidental characters so that the mix represents the frequency and variation of people that you want your world to reflect. Reconsider your, your intentional or unintentional default settings. Um, what do you tend to use for background characters and bit parts? Um, for instance, if we have an unconscious white default, which many of us do, we see white characters as the norm that we only occasionally de uh, deviate from in special cases and only then is when the character's skin color would be mentioned. Um, whiteness becomes the unmarked invisible default, but anything else somehow requires justification or explanation. But there doesn't actually need to be a reason for a character to have a particular identity, and it doesn't need to figure into the plot in any way or have a justification. They can just be there, and that's fine. I sometimes refer to this as re-rolling my background characters. So taking the characters that um, we already have and then keeping their personality and role in the story the same, but trying on different combinations of gender, sexual identity, ethnic background, or other traits uh, that seem to be underrepresented in the world of the piece. And I mean re-rolling metaphorically. Um, I suppose that if you really have trouble flexing your imagination in this way, you could use some form of real random number generation and produce results. Um, I'm not sure I recommend that. It seems a little procedural and trivial, uh, literally rolling the die on diversity. Um, I think we can be a little bit more deliberate than that. So anyway, after you re-roll uh, some background characters, uh, see how much else about them you can just leave as is. Um, you might be tempted to change a bunch of other aspects about them to mold them to fit some particular stereotype that you might have. Um, but just try sitting with it for a while first and see if it works. Um, the results might surprise you. Um, a diversity consultant can still be helpful to spot if by using this method you've inadvertently created an unrealistic or incongruous representation that will ring false. Um, one example that I saw discussed again from the world of sensitivity reading in young adult fiction, a, sensit a sensitivity reader flagged a character um, who was a black girl who loved going to national parks and pointed out, well, actually, because of the historical systems where black people traditionally, you know, or by law were excluded from national parks, that's an uncommon hobby to have. So therefore, like, it's highly unusual that this person would have this as a personality choice. So, you know, if you, by re-rolling a character, wound up with like black girl interests love national parks, somebody might flag like, hey, you might want to think about that, but. Um, I still found this a good way of sort of shaking up ingrained habits and discovering characters that otherwise wouldn't have occurred to me or with traits that I wouldn't necessarily have put together. So finally, um, for the last little bit, um, I'll share a few cases where I've used these approaches in my own work. Um, and I want to talk about two games in particular, um, Guns of Icarus Online and Lamplight City. So first, uh, Guns of Icarus Online, I worked on this um, on my first job in the game industry uh, as a designer and writer at Muse Games. Um, Guns of Icarus Online is a first-person multiplayer online team-based steampunk airship combat game, uh, which is a string of syllables I have said many <laughs> times, although not for a few years, so getting a little rusty now. Um, 
We launched it in 2012 with a PVP arena combat mode, and it's been in kind of continuous development ever since, it's still going. Um, I was the team's sole writer, and I handled most of the world building and narrative elements, uh, and laid the groundwork for this larger persistent world and systems that would support something more like an MMO, which the game is slowly growing toward. So the world of Guns of Icarus was conceived as an alternate history, post-apocalyptic landscape with steampunk aesthetics. Um, the backstory was that in this world, World War I never ended, and the conflict basically continued until global civilization collapsed. And 100 years later, these scattered populations of survivors were left battling over scarce resources in the ruins of this world that was dominated by airships as the primary means of transport and combat. So our world wasn't set in any declared geographical location, and we sort of hand-waved the unfamiliar landscape as the result of global climate change and unspecified catastrophe. Like seas and continents have moved. Don't think about it that much. Um, but to support the idea that there had been these massive refugee migrations and shuffling of nat national boundaries, um, we wanted to show the cultures of this new world that were divided into six major player factions um, were a kind of syncretic remix of real, real world cultures, languages, and national identities. Um, so building the world of Guns of Icarus really involved taking in and recombining lots of disparate cultural influences, and I wanted to make sure that I was doing it in a sensitive and respectful way. So first, I did a lot of research. Um, I looked for inspiration to blogs like The Steamer Trunk, uh, which is now sadly defunct, and Beyond Victoriana, which is still kicking. Um, they both specialize in surfacing and celebrating uh, these multicultural and post-colonial depictions of steampunk aesthetics, um, both modern interpretations like cosplay and also inspirations from the period, like old photographs. Um, since the steampunk scene tends to come with a lot of upper class white English Victorian colonial, colonial imperialist baggage, um, sources like these are kind of really important palate cleanser and a way to help you imagine differently and get out of those ingrained ideas. And as a quick detour, if this thread of decolonizing steampunk narratives is something you want to hear more about, I heartily recommend this talk by Meg Jayanth. Um, about 80 days. Uh, it's called 80 Days and Unexpected Stories, and it's free on YouTube or the GDC Vault from 2015. So one of my biggest tasks on this game was building the world map, um, particularly assigning place names and naming all of the factions, the characters, the non-player ships, and everything else. Um, so I researched examples of toponymy and compiled long lists of place names with different origins and grouped them into rough regional clusters on the map. Uh, we had names drawn from Russian, French, Latin, English, Greek, Chinese, uh, quite a few more. So I got as far as I could on my own research, but I didn't want to do the naming equivalent of the tourist who gets the Hanzi tattoo that's supposed to be peace or <laughs> prosperity. Um, but instead it, instead it says chicken noodle soup or big mistake. <laughs> so another tactic that I used was to take advantage of the cultural backgrounds that we had actually represented on the team. Um, so I asked team members to draw up and give me uh, name lists and uh, words that could be combined into names and also to review and comment on the final selections to make sure that nothing weird got through and that it all kind of made sense. Um, one member of the team could contribute Quechua names, another German, another Japanese, and, um, and so there was a second pair of eyes on almost everything and not just me Googling stuff. Um, in particular, our team had a lot of developers from Taiwan and China or with Chinese heritage. Um, so we used what we had, and Chinese language and culture played a large role in the world of Guns of Icarus. Um, for instance, they were able to suggest appropriate, uh, culturally appropriate animal symbology, um, like the ruling triumvirate of one faction that's represented by a different animal, the ox, the tiger, and the deer. 
Um, it's been a little while and I've forgotten the specifics. I think the ox was responsible for internal affairs and the tiger was war and the deer was diplomacy and trade, something like that. Um, I've forgotten it now, but it was reassuring at the time to have a somewhat better source for these choices than some Zodiac trivia on a restaurant placemat. Uh, <laughs> so the name that we settled on for this faction, too, came from a suggestion from one of our developers in Taiwan. Um, my understanding is it means something like sands in the night. Um, which is a sort of poetic reflection of the society that had been built out of the dust of ruins and darkness and in constant motion and change. Um, if I'd tried to come up with this name myself, it might have been something like dark like dust, the kind of debris you get out of the vacuum cleaner or something. <laughs> I don't know. I, I wasn't going to get there on my own. So expanding beyond the resources that we had available on the development team, I also used the phone a friend strategy. Um, an online pal of mine was always blogging this fascinating stuff about the history and culture of her native Romania. So uh, she graciously agreed to help out with naming, naming a Romanian cluster of towns. Um, the fruits of this collaboration now reside in that little corner of the map called the vastness. So finally, the, the other game that I'll talk about today is much more recent work um, and quite a bit more nuanced and complex in terms of the representation that we dealt with. Um, so Lamplight City is a point and click adventure game uh, released last year by Grindislav Games, uh, largely a solo effort by developer Francisco Gonzalez, uh, also happens to be my partner. Um, and I'd given feedback and advice on his work before. This is the first game of his that I worked on in an official capacity as an editor and narrative consultant. So Lamplight City is also set in an alt history universe with steampunk trappings. In this case, the Vespucian city of New Britannia, a kind of blend of New York City and New Orleans um, in the mid 19th century. Um, and it's billed as a detective mystery where you can get things wrong. And it's inspired by the work of Poe and, Dick, of Poe and Dickens. Uh, Poe for mystery and the macabre, and Dickens for class struggle and social unrest. Um, the game features a pretty broad palette of representation, and it deals with some heavy themes of discrimination and marginalization of various groups. Women, the poor, people with mental illness, queer people, people of color. Um, and these are sensitive subjects, so we took a lot of care to try and do them justice in the story. So as a consultant, one aspect of the story that I could immediately address um, was the representation of women and the gender politics of the world. And one of the first things that I looked for is to see if women constitute at least roughly half of the characters, um, especially main characters with agency in the story. And in this case, the player character, Detective Miles Fordham, was male. Uh, and three of, of, three of the major um, non-player characters, only one, Miles' wife, Addie, was a woman. Um, and I didn't really like this mix. Um, so I brought out one of my favorite tactics, the character re-roll that I mentioned earlier. And one of the very first suggestions I made in the game was to change the character of Edward Upton the main support character who slips the player cases and provides guidance and advice from a man into a woman. And the result is what I think is one of the best, if not the best character in the game, uh, the police desk officer, Constance Connie Upton. Um, and I also insisted that none of the other already established details about the character should really change as a result of this. So she remained an overweight, desk-bound officer with marital troubles, a brave and loyal friend with an impish sense of humor, and this easy, teasing rapport with her old buddy Miles, who habitually greeted her as up to no good. Like, I, I like all that. All that stays in. Um, and the result was this easygoing, sort of steadfast, platonic friendship between a man and a woman who were professional colleagues and I can't help but think that this dynamic would have been different if Connie had been conceived as a woman originally. 
And she still had her clandestine meetings with Miles in a coffee shop, although we had already determined that, as in the real world during the era, these establishments were traditionally off limits to women. Um, so we wanted to keep this detail in, and we added a line showing how Connie had used her official position to strong arm the coffee house owner into turning a blind eye and letting her be there. Um, so this helped us establish attitudes of gender discrimination that were in the world, as well as showing Connie as an assertive risk taker who wasn't afraid of bending, if not breaking the rules. So we also further developed Connie's backstory. Originally, Edward Upton was to have suspected his wife of cheating with the idea that the player could help uncover this truth in the course of the story. And after the gender swap, we changed this to establish that Miles and Connie had originally become friends when he helped furnish the proof of her abusive husband's infidelity that she needed in order to legally secure a divorce. Um, and this, again, helped to convey how the lopsided laws of this society were oppressing women, but also how someone resourceful and determined like Connie might need to navigate them to survive. So that's one way that I used the character reroll in Lamplight City, which ended up deepening the world building and giving us a great character in what otherwise could have been a fairly rote role. So I rerolled the gender of one other minor background character in this game, in this case, changing the secretary in the law office from a woman into a man. Um, while that didn't do any favors for the overall gender balance of the cast, it did reduce the proportion of women in the game who had secretarial or service roles. So if you're finding that your representatives of marginalized groups are mainly cropping up in these kinds of supporting and subordinate roles, especially ones lacking agency, it's not a bad idea to shift things around. The law clerk wasn't a real character with any kind of an arc. Uh, he was just there to give you information and get in your way. So give your minority characters juicier roles and maybe just stick the white guy behind a desk once in a while. So we also consulted with friends about certain aspects of the story that we wanted to get right. One issue was the depiction of race and racism in the game, which plays a fairly large role in the story. Miles, a white man, is in a mixed marriage with his wife, Addie, a black hairdresser who was a former lounge singer, and we see some of the ways that they face discrimination. And in the very first case of the game, you're tasked with clearing the name of a man who seems to have been falsely accused on account of his race and isn't receiving fair treatment from the justice system. But race originally played an even more prominent role in the story until we re received feedback from testers that made us rethink that. We established in the world building that the emancipation of slaves had happened fairly recently in the history of this country and that uh, one, of the early, uh, one of the early cases originally revolved around a grand dame, uh, one of the city's social elites, who was known for offering paid employment to her former slaves. And this was regarded as especially compassionate and merciful by her peers, but was a cover for acts of abuse. We got feedback from testers saying that the heavy themes of slavery and racism were distracting and disturbing, and not important enough to the narrative to justify their inclusion. So we listened and we changed the focus of this case. In the new scenario, references to slavery were removed and instead of the domestic servants being former slaves, the unusual thing about the Grand Dame's household was that she decided to keep employing people when others were replacing them with steam tech machines. So this brought the story more in line with some of the game's larger themes like class struggle and anxieties about increasing mechanization this kind of second steampunk industrial revolution based on airships and steam contraptions and experiments in a form of energy called ethericity. But more important, we avoided including a polarizing and unnecessarily disturbing detail that served little purpose other than shock value. So. The final bit that I'd like to talk about is how we sought out consultation about how to handle specific scenes of racial discrimination in the game. The player, as Miles, witnesses some instances of racist comments and attitudes directed toward his wife, Addie. Originally, the player would be offered a few options to respond to these remarks, either to defend Addie or let them pass unchallenged with consequences for the relationship. 
If you failed to speak up on her behalf, Addie would feel betrayed and would later reproach you for your silence. Why didn't you say anything? But when we discussed these scenes with friends who were themselves in mixed couples, they pointed out that from their perspective, it would be more realistic for the white person in the couple to be more righteously indignant on their partner's behalf um, and reflexively want to protest, while the person of color might tend to try to defuse or downplay the situation. Um, they would be more accustomed to encountering slights like these and needing to let them go just as a kind of matter of daily survival. So in the final version of the game, while the player gets a few different lines to choose from, Miles will always be indignant. He will always say something. And when he tries to commiserate with Addie by complaining that she shouldn't have to listen to stuff like that, she's the one who shrugs it off. She's heard worse. If she stopped putting up with all the casually racist ladies whose hair she styles, she says, then she wouldn't have any clients at all. You have no say at all in how this scene plays out. When a police officer, whom you're trying to distract from something he's guarding in, a, in classic adventure game fashion, um, when he directs racist insults towards Addie, Miles just decks him. It's no slow playing this one. So if we'd just gone ahead with those scenes as we'd originally envisioned them based on our intuition, we'd have gotten it wrong. But because we saw input from people with personal experience of the dynamics that we were trying to depict, we wrote something that was much more real. So I'm running slightly over time, but very quickly, we've covered a lot of ground. So I do want to briefly recap some of the takeaways. First, Hiring or building a team, make diversity a priority. Hire diversity consultants, especially if you're writing culturally sensitive material. Budget for the expense. Whether or not you're using paid consultants, you can also seek feedback from friends with relevant cultural or personal backgrounds. Take care that you're not using experiences of trauma and oppression to power your narrative without a real understanding of their impact. If these themes are indispensable to your story, get consultation about them. Instead of casting them in traditionally oppressive roles, give your marginalized characters power and narrative agency. Make them driving subjects, not passing, passive objects in your story. Reject notions of the cis straight white male as the unmarked default. Switch up the traits of your in incidental background characters. Reroll them to achieve the diversity that you're going for. Always do your research. Whether or not you're using a familiar genre setting or a fictional world, what you find will probably surprise you. Listen to what people are saying about how they see themselves represented in media and educate yourself about the latest discourse. Support and make room for marginalized voices telling their own stories. Instead of scrambling for a few seats, let's make a bigger table so there's room for everyone. So pull up a chair and tell your story. Thank you. Only slightly over, but hopefully we can take just a few questions. Um, I don't. Uh, they might be out there. I mean, also when you're looking for a sensitivity reader, they will list. They will like self-list. Here are all the things that I have experiences of. You know, I, I, you know, am a non-binary person. I have experiences of you know substance abuse and you know you know, some certain kind of disability, like they'll list like very specific categories. So if there is like one specific thing you're looking for, you can filter by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, yeah, so the one thing that you do, that you don't want to do is just put that character on the page, being completely ignorant of all of that and having it be a surprise. Like maybe you get that feedback and you're like, no, but I do want to show this little black girl that gosh darn it loves camping. And 
maybe you say like, yeah, you know, she had this cool aunt who took her camping and like that's where she got the love and like write in a source to address it. Or maybe you think like, well, again, maybe I don't have to justify it. She can just be this character, even though I know that that's unusual, but that I want to put that image out in the world. And I think just sort of knowing that and having that intention will affect how you write the character and how you put it out there. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, being afraid of being ignorant is like one of the hurdles that I'm trying to like help us all get over. Um, not just that like, well, I don't know, so I don't want to make a mistake. Um, but even if you do put that mistake on the page, like that sensitivity reader can help you catch it and help you feel a little safer. Um, I think you should probably wind up in that like, what do I do category with like, all right, you can't do a ton of research. You don't have anybody who can speak for this group or who can check your facts. Like then, yeah, just don't make diversity, you know, identities central to your story. Like do just, um, you know, have those empowered characters who don't reference the fact like, oh, because I am a non-binary person of color, like this is my, just like, have them be in the story and do awesome things. Like I said, just having people just show up and be visible and be awesome is a really useful thing too. Um, again, I think they'd be more common in the, um, in the just general uh, resources for like people writing young adult books, like looking for sensitivity readers and stuff, people will identify with those specific categories, probably the people who, and then also say, and video games is a lot smaller. But um, I'm also hoping that as, you know, we make a practice of game developers using these resources, that if we just contact editors and say, hey, would you mind, you know, reading a script for a game? Like, I know you usually do books, but, I'd love your perspective and like, you know, pitch the idea to these editors that probably plenty of them would be happy to be like, oh, a game that sounds like so much fun, sure. So I'd love to build those bridges. Good to hear, thank you. Okay, well, I've held you guys a bit over time, I think. So uh, that's it, thank you very much.